Pascal Sorio has played a vital role in tackling the biggest health crisis of our time. As a chief executive of AstraZeneca, he's overseen the production of one of the leading vaccines against COVID-19. The COVID pandemic tested us, but at the end of the day, I, thought, I think it was really a positive for our organization. First of all, because everybody is very proud, very proud of the difference we've made globally. Again, more than 2 billion doses of vaccine, 30% of global supply or close to 30%. Sorio has led AstraZeneca for almost a decade fending off a takeover bid from Pfizer along the way. I'm suddenly used to having to compete and fight for what, what you believe on. That drives my focus on performance. I'm used to setbacks, I'm used to challenges, and that's a spirit I always try to instill in the organization. In this episode of Leaders with Lacqua, we talk to Pascal Sorio about what drives him in his work, where we are in fighting the pandemic, and the challenges they faced in developing their vaccine. There's nothing really that we would do differently. Politics was always going to be part of uh, this issue. It probably was more than we had anticipated, but it was always going to be part of this issue because we expected issues of moving vaccines around the world. We expected export bans. We expected you know, debate around the value of vaccines. So we expected a lot of uh, political issues and debates. Pascal Sorio, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders with Lacqua. Do you remember where you were and who you spoke to the minute where you realized how big and how dangerous the pandemic was going to be and what role AstraZeneca could play in it? Yeah, absolutely. January 2020. Um, you know, we have a large presence in China. We have about 20,000 employees in China. We are the largest pharmaceutical company there. So as you can imagine, I'm very close to our Chinese team. And very early on in January, I realized that uh, this was going to be a big issue because, uh, you know, I was talking to our teams, team in China every week, uh, twice a week, actually, to see how they were doing. And I realized this was going to spread and become a, a global problem. So what did you learn at the time about yourself and what did you learn about AstraZeneca? Well, I learned a lot about, uh, you know, uh, the company as a whole and the kind of uh, people who work for this company because we immediately uh, thought, how do we help? What can we do to help? And, you know, everybody across the company was ready to do something. So we started very modestly buying masks and distributing them to a hospital in needs. If you remember at the time, PPE was, uh, was a big deal and the lack of masks mm -hmm. was a big problem. We looked at our pipeline of products. How could we repurpose some of our medicines to help? We started developing a long acting antibody combination. And then at some point we uh, came, up, uh, came across the Oxford vaccine and decided to develop it. So we really learned about uh, leaving our values. Um, and uh, the whole company very quickly stepped up. We learned the value of collaboration uh, with the mm -hmm. private and the, and the public sector. And we learned, we learned the value of being entrepreneurial, nimble, and, and also resilient because this has been quite a journey and the resilience of the organization was te tested at times. Uh, Pascal, what was that first phone call with Oxford like? And, and what was it like when actually the vaccine got approved after the trial? Was it jubilation? Was it, you know, cautious expectations? Well, the first uh, phone call was really a great phone call because, you know, we again, we were thinking, how do we help? And the, we thought, you know, we have potential treatments. Uh, we have a long acting antibody combination in development. A vaccine would be the next step. And this looks like a, a great technology. And, you know, we um, many, many, many people at AZ have connections with Oxford University. And uh, we know a number of people there. So the first uh, contact by telephone was, of course, an, an easy one because we knew each other. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the results, uh, it was, of course, very energizing. We were so happy to have a vaccine that uh, works and can make a difference globally. But we never really had much time to think and celebrate. We did celebrate a little bit, but essentially we were go, 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 because time was of the essence to get approval, to manufacture. And as you know, we had a few challenges uh, in some geographies. In some geographies in the world, it went very well. And, and in other countries, it was more challenging to supply. So we didn't have much time to think and celebrate. We were focused on uh, delivering and, uh, and making sure people could get access to our vaccine. 
Yeah, and I imagine between the go, 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 and of course being in the middle of a political firestorm in certain cases as well, was quite challenging. What was the most infuriating or frustrating part of the process? Well, nothing was infuriating. You know, in our industry, we're used to challenges. I mean, you tackle a big problem like cancer, and you try to develop new treatments, um, and sometimes you succeed, sometimes you fail. And sometimes some of those failures are, of course, uh, large ones and very disappointing. So we are used to dealing with challenges and, and success and setbacks and sometimes criticisms. And, you know, it's part of life, really. Um, so we had to take it on the chin and deal with it and try our best. And our focus was really on, again, delivering the vaccine to the world. And, you know, I think people sometimes forget that Europe, of course, is a very important continent. Look, I'm a European, I love Europe. But Europe, not everybody in the world lives in Europe. I mean, there's another more than 7 billion people living outside the US and, and Europe. And in many, many parts of the world, in most parts of the world, everything went well. So when, you, when we were looking at it on a global basis, we realized we had to help Europe more than uh, uh, to, to, to deliver more vaccine. But we also knew that elsewhere in the world, everything was going very well. Pascal, was there anything that you would do differently with hindsight, the benefit of hindsight, in Europe? And do you feel like you were unfairly politicized at moments? I, you know, I mean, I think sometimes people uh, uh, try to read too much uh, with hindsight. I mean, it's like running a clinical trial. If the trial fails, people, people will ask you, would you do this trial again? I mean, if you know it fails, of course you will not run it again. <laughs> but this is hindsight. I mean, so there's, there's nothing really that we would do differently. Um, again, you know, Politics was always going to be part of uh, this issue. It probably was more than we had anticipated, but it was always going to be part of this issue because we expected um, issues of moving vaccines around the world. We expected mm -hmm. export bans. We expected you know, debate around the value of vaccines. Um, so we expected a lot of uh, political issues and debates. It was more than, in Europe, it was more than expected, of course. But we, you know, stayed totally focused on delivering the vaccine and solving the problems as they came. Up next, Pascal Sorio discusses the battle against vaccine disinformation and how the pandemic could transform the world for years to come. It's likely that uh, this pandemic uh, will be a, a endemic over time. I mean, it is already more or less endemic in, many, in some geographies in the world, which means it will be like the flu. It will come back on a regular basis and people may have to be vaccinated. Now, the question is, do you need to be vaccinated every year, every two years? Um, we don't know that and it will depend on the durability of these vaccines. Pascal Soryo has an unparalleled insight into fighting the coronavirus pandemic as chief executive of pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca. We discuss the challenges posed by vaccine disinformation, making drugs sustainably, and what COVID-19 could mean for us in the years to come. Will we need yearly booster shots to deal with the pandemic? I know, again, it's still early days, but how do you see this panning out over the next four, five, ten years? I think uh, it's likely that uh, this pandemic uh, will be a, a endemic over time. I mean, it is already more or less endemic in, many, in some geographies in the world, which means it will be like the flu. It will come back on a regular basis and people may have to be vaccinated. And now the question is, do you need to be vaccinated every year, every two years? Um, we don't know that and it will depend on the durability of these vaccines. Um, so again, that's why we need more data, more follow-up. And collecting data is absolutely fundamental because right now we are in the urgency of the, of the moment, which is to stop this pandemic from spreading. But we all also have to think about how we're going to live with this virus um, being endemic like the flu is. And therefore, how often do we vaccinate people? Only time and data will tell us that. Is that why you've recently also changed this, you know, for-profit model? And would, would it have been wiser to wait for the WHO to call it an endemic instead of a pandemic? Well, the, you have to think about um, the fact that the uh, for-profit approach, which, by the way, as a reminder, is always going to be a modest profit, 
applies to new orders. So the new orders will be delivered mostly next year. So we are really talking about next year. Mm -hmm. Now, next year, hopefully, we will have, as a society globally, made even more progress in terms of vaccinating people. So, so you know, that's the environment the, the, that you have to consider this decision, number one. Number two, our price will always be quite reasonable. So it will go from no profit for some countries to some profit mm -hmm. for others that have more ability to pay. Um, but we will always look for modest profitability because at the end of the day, our company is about uh, cancer. It's about cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, rare diseases. And we will never look to mm -hmm. make uh, enormous profits out of this vaccine. Pascal, whose job is it to fight misinformation about vaccines or you know, drug companies in general? Well, we have a team of people who are constantly looking at uh, you know, what is being said about uh, vaccines and uh, other products, but mostly vaccines, of course. And there has been a lot of misinformation uh, in the world, uh, in social media in particular, about vaccines. Unfortunately, um, um, you know, this sometimes influences people. You have, you have to really keep in mind vaccination is the, the first line of defense. And at the end of the day, whichever vaccine you take is going to be better than no vaccination. Um, and you have multiple different uh, vaccines around the world uh, mm -hmm. that are available to people. And it's unfortunate that uh, this misinformation is actually creating anxiety and creating doubts in people's yeah. mind. Um, and we try to correct this misinformation where we can, but I have to say there's so much going on in social media that it's yeah. often difficult to cope with it all. Yeah. I mean, are, are you lobbying technological companies like social media companies to do more in that fight, which is, I guess, your fight with the regulator and also politicians? What we would try to do is make sure that uh, people uh, stay true to the facts and the science and uh, correct any misinformation that is put out there and then try to stop people from uh, spreading uh, incorrect information. But, but again, as I said, it's very difficult because it is happening so much uh, in social media across the world. You really find it difficult to control it, to not control, but to correct everything. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I think you also have to rely on positive information, correct information that governments and, uh, and experts can actually bring to the, pu the public to give them the right information to make decisions for themselves. Uh, Pascal, we also had a good conversation, of course, at Glasgow COP26. Um, so are you making or anticipating making any changes to some of your drug developments or how you distribute drugs to be more environmentally friendly? Yeah, absolutely. As I said before, you know, the, some of the societal um, priorities are really critical, not only because as a company, you need to do the right thing and contribute to uh, sustainable development of the world. But also because if you want to uh, bring your uh, team with you, you have to address some of these issues mm -hmm. that are critical to them. And sustainability, climate change is one of those. So we committed to be carbon neutral by 2025 for our own operations and carbon negative by 2030 for the totality of our supply chain. And the supply chain part is the most challenging part because we have good plans in place to be carbon neutral by 2025 for our own operations. The site in Cambridge, the R&D site we're opening is a good example of a sustainable site. The most challenging piece is the totality of the supply chain. And so we are engaging with other companies in industry to collaborate to work with our suppliers, to work together to help them uh, reduce their carbon footprint so we can achieve our goals. And you know, this is yeah. something that the sustainable market initiatives of the Prince Charles can really help us achieve, bringing companies across the industry and the healthcare system as a whole together to collaborate to, to impact uh, our carbon emissions. Up next, showing leadership under pressure. From fending off takeover bids to navigating political firestorms, Pascal Sorio takes us inside some of the key challenges in his time in charge of AstraZeneca. I'm suddenly used to having to compete and fight for what, what you believe on. That drives my focus on performance. I'm used to setbacks, I'm used to challenges, and that's a spirit I always try to instill in the organization.
wherever you get your this news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak with Lee. On Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg Technology. This is Bloomberg Green. On TV, radio, and the web, this is Bloomberg. Pascal Sorio's tenure as chief executive of one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies has been anything but simple. During his decade in charge of AstraZeneca, he's fended off a takeover bid from Pfizer, secured the largest deal in the company's history with a $39 billion purchase of Alexion, and faced a rocky road to produce a coronavirus vaccine. We discussed how he navigated these challenges and the role his leadership style played. Uh, Pascal, you've been in charge of AstraZeneca more or less over a decade, and you've transformed the company. You've also had to fend off, you know, the approach by Pfizer. How does the pandemic compare to that? Yes, I've been used to uh, challenges and setbacks and success, of course, over the years. And we've had, as a company, we've had many more successes than we have had setbacks. But we did have setbacks across uh, uh, our pipeline developing new products. Uh, a few years ago, we had a large study that was very important that failed and our share price suffered from it. So, you know, it's not, it's never, I should say, it's never a straightforward journey in our industry. Um, so certainly the uh, approach by Pfizer many years ago was, uh, uh, was a, you know, something that pressure tested the organization and us as a management team. The COVID vaccine, the COVID, the COVID pandemic tested us. But at the end of the day, I, th I think it was really a positive for our organization. First of all, because everybody is very proud very proud of the difference we've made globally. Again, more than 2 billion doses of vaccine, 30% of global supply or close to 30%. Secondly, it really tested us as an organization and it showed the commitment of our people, the resilience of our people. And in our industry, you have to be resilient. You have to, be, you have to innovate, mm -hmm. but you also have to be resilient. Sometimes your idea doesn't work the first time around and you have to keep going. So it really tested the resilience of the organization and it really reinforced the team spirit across the company. So of course, it was sometimes a little bit stressful, but overall, it really helped us as an organization mature and grow and become even stronger. Pascal, how would you describe your leadership style? So I know you've talked in the past about, you know, growing up in the outskirts of Paris. Are you a fighter? Well, I am uh, certainly used to uh, having to stand up for, for what you believe in and uh, in the quote unquote fighting for your ideas and, and, and you know, driving change is not always uh, simple. Um, so I'm certainly used to having to compete and fight for what, what you believe on and, and, and really um, that drives my focus on performance. Nothing really came easy uh, to me in my life. So I'm used to, I'm, I'm used to setbacks, I'm used to challenges. Mm -hmm. And that's a spirit I always try to instill in the organization, which is we have to perform. We have to drive innovation. We have to be resilient. We have to accept uh, challenges and setbacks. And we have to stay focused on the goal. The goal is mm. to come up with new medicines that make a difference to patients. It's very simple. And then we will, we, you know, through this journey, we will have ups and downs and we just have to take it as it comes and, and keep, keep pushing. How would you describe, Pascal, your leadership style? And actually, does it, is it different being a leader in 2022 to when it was like in 2012? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it changes constantly. You know, society changes, people's uh, expectations change. Uh, what worked uh, 15, 20 years ago may not work today. Technology changes and it has an impact on, on society and, and the way we operate. Um, but I think what always works is really trying to inspire people for a common goal, uh, developing a shared purpose. People are never so excited and committed um, as when they share a common purpose. And our purpose is really to follow the science, do what's right for patients, and then build a, a portfolio of medicines that will change the practice of the treatment of, the treatment of cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, and, and also today uh, rare diseases. So that's what I try to do, to share, to build a shared purpose and a common goal, and then you know, bring to people what they need actually to succeed, the tools they need, mm -hmm. the cultural environment they need, 
Um, and to these days, different things are important to people. I mean, diversity, for instance, has always been important, but it's never been as important as today. Uh, people are realizing the importance of uh, uh, working in a diverse organization. Sustainability, climate change is becoming critically important yeah. to people, especially young people. So if as a company you don't uh, commit to some of those uh, uh, important priorities for the world, then you don't bring people with you. Um, Pascal, Prince Charles has opened your new one billion pound research and development facility in the UK. What looks most promising in the pipeline? What are you most hopeful on? Uh, sometimes people ask me that question and it's uh, always like uh, choosing uh, between your kids. I mean, which, which one do you prefer? Oh. <laughs> um, I like all our products. We have a tremendous uh, lineup of uh, new products that treat cancer. Of course, recently, we had uh, absolutely tremendous results in uh, breast cancer with a new product. We are developing a so-called antibody drug conjugate that really mm -hmm. delivered uh, amazing results in the treatment of HER2 breast cancer. We also have had uh, results in uh, kidney disease, heart disease. Um, we've also had uh, other, other results in um, liver cancer, biliary tract cancer. Uh, which are cancers that haven't seen much progress in the last few years. We've had results in the treatment of Wilson disease, a rare disease which is an accumulation of copper in the body. Um, so we've had results across a whole range of uh, conditions and we continue building the pipeline. And here in Cambridge, uh, we are at the heart of uh, science really in the Cambridge community and we have tremendous technologies to develop new products for the future. Pascal, in the 10 years you've been in charge, what do you still like most about your job? <laughs> Learning every day, <laughs> discovering new things. Uh, uh, science is the most exciting thing you can imagine. Um, and, and as I said a minute ago, uh, the development and the progress of science uh, in, you know, in the last few years has been incredible. And in fact, uh, you know, you cannot know everything and uh, even though you stay curious and you try to learn, uh, it's moving so fast. So, you know, learning is the most exciting and making an impact. Uh, when you get results like uh, we got recently for the of treatment of breast cancer, liver cancer, um, Wilson disease, kidney disease, and you know you are helping patients and making a huge difference, that is definitely very exciting and, you mm -hmm. know, it's hard to be bored in our industry, uh, trust me. Yeah, I'm sure. What do you like least about your job then? Uh, there's not much I, 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 uh, I don't like in my job. Um, I try to keep the administrative part as little as possible. Um, but of course, you know, there are some dimensions to this job that, uh, that have to be considered as well. But I, stay, I try to stay focused on, on what matters. And what matters is science, developing new products, uh, meeting people, recruiting tremendous uh, scientists, uh, talented people across not only R&D, but also our commercial teams, our manufacturing teams, and uh, you know, staying close to where the action is taking place. And that's the only way, I think, to run a company, and that's the best way to remain excited and, uh, and, and suddenly making a difference. Pascal Sorio, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Francine. It was a great pleasure to be with you today.